happened in his bedroom. Yes, well, that was really bizarre and um, disturbing experience. We were living in a, a big old apartment which had just been renovated in Chala Street, Pops Point. And my two-year-old son was having nightmares. He'd wake up screaming every night. And he'd wake up holding onto the side of the cot, shouting dead babies. And he had a very small vocabulary anyway. So I was very, very confused and confronted that he was he knew these two words, let alone what they might mean. Um, his younger brother, at five weeks old, had just had meningitis. And so it did occur to me that he might have overheard adults you know, being fearful for Seamus, my younger son's well-being, and they might have said he could die. So maybe that's where he had heard it from. But either way, he would stand up shouting. And every night I'd put him into bed. He'd go to bed calmly, but he'd wake up around 2 a.m. screaming dead baby. So I'd pick him up and take him to bed with me. And weeks later, a friend came to visit, and she came up the central staircase of this big building and said, she said, oh, my God, do you live here? And I said, yes. Yeah. And she said, I came here. She said it looks completely different. It's been renovated. But she had come there when she was a young girl. She was still at school to have an abortion. And the abortion was in that apartment. That had been an abortion clinic. And the bedroom that he stepped in was where the abortion took place. The room next door was the recovery room. And we both just stood there and looked at each other and um, hugged each other. Uh, I had no idea what any of that means. I certainly wasn't making any comment about abortion in telling that story, and I hope no one would think I was because I certainly believe every woman should do what is right for their body. But it was a very unsettling explanation as to why my son was um, not able to sleep. And then years later, we were telling ghost stories around a campfire up in um, the Snowy Mountains, and my son were telling stories and he sort of went pale and went inside and I said, are you all right? And he said, mum, I remember, I remember my <coughs> those dreams I had. And he said, what was that? And I said, I have no idea, but I believe you, but, you know, don't know what that yeah. was. But, um, I mean, that was a bizarre story that I included in there. I included it more because I think children, I mean, none of us are prepared to have children. <laughs> Having children is such a huge thing and it's such a gift and it's so extraordinary but having children can take you in so many different directions and most unexpected experiences come out of having children mm -hmm. i mean it speaks to that sense that so many of us have when we go to a place where something tragic has happened that somehow the place remembers yes and it's more that maybe children who knows maybe oh. they can pick up on the essence of something i have heard many stories from people i know even whose children have um somehow picked up on something from the past or some family drama who knows I, I, i'm drawing absolutely no conclusions about anything um i just put things out there that's all it strikes me heather as you're talking that like so many artists you are a person of contradiction because you're talking as though you're a sensible rational <laughs> I do woman. think I'm a very sensible rational person. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I'm a very quite a logical person. I'm quite um I'm always get, I prepare for things. I'm quite um sensible, yeah. And and yet you've written your book in a way that's not actually rational and chronological. It keeps circling back on itself because the interconnectedness of stories seems to be essential to the way in which you experience your life. So the book is roughly chronological, but you're always going forward or going back to find an event that somehow resonates with the now. Well, I think that that's, uh, I never intended to write a memoir, uh, so I didn't sit down to write one. I was writing because the wonderful Malcolm Knox, who's a brilliant novelist and a journalist, just invited me to write a story. So I wrote one and he said, write another one, another one. So they are very much fragmented moments from my life They're, and it's definitely not a as you say a book about the industry and i didn't even know what i was writing about and i didn't read back over my stories i would just write them as they would occur to me so that's why it's not chronological that's why it's not um i mean i honestly had no idea what i was writing i <laughs> i just kept writing <laughs> so it just occurred organically really very much so so i'd write that first story about my mother's death and then i thought oh well now i'll write about my mother and then i'll write about her sisters and then I'll write about my father, and then I'll write about the moment that I first occurred to me that acting was something that resonated with me or 
and it would just go on like that. So one of the times you're not drawn to write about is NIDA. I mean, you say you went to NIDA, but then we move rapidly on. Is, is there a reason why NIDA wasn't? No, but, uh, well, I think because Malcolm said after about the third story, I did write a, a chapter about more about acting and about learning lines, how I process it and what I do. And I think NIDA came into that. And he said, I think that's a separate book. This book's a different book. So I put that aside. You know, I think he felt this is very much more a book of what you're describing, a personal reflection on, on incidents in my life which became stories. Mm. They were sort of defining moments that became a story in my mind, yeah. You, you say that neither is where you began to question whether transcendental meditation was right for you and that mm. actually you ceased meditating. What, what did that give you as an actor? Look, I stopped meditating for some time because I felt uh, very accepting of everything. <laughs> I never argued with my parents. I didn't argue with anyone. I didn't, I didn't sort of feel conflicted about things. And I thought, I got into NIDA and I was thrilled. Uh, obviously, it was, you know, a, a huge thing for me. And I thought, I felt like I wasn't going to be able to um, access real conflicted, interesting feelings that made human beings so interesting. So I, I felt I needed to go through some rough times, I guess. So I didn't consider my mother's death as a difficult time. I thought I needed to go through, you know, ups and downs. I needed some real ups and downs. <laughs> right. So by not meditating, what meditating sort of did for me is it, it did keep me in a place of centeredness. So by not meditating gradually, I started to feel less, more of a lack of equilibrium, started to hear things I didn't hear before. You know, your attention just goes elsewhere. Started to feel a little more fragmented. I began to feel all the things that make up who we are as people, I guess, because uh, we're very multifaceted and our emotions run deep. And, and it was great, but then I discovered that if you're feeling conflicted, and if you're feeling your mind's wandering off in areas that are not particularly helpful, it is actually counterproductive and counterintuitive to actually doing good work or achieving the things you want to achieve. So I gradually started meditating again because I thought, in the end, I'm a human being. I can access those feelings. I don't have to be fraught all the time to access them. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. Mm. It really does make sense. I remember going to a workshop. I wish I knew who ran this, but I can't remember. Going to a theatre workshop in which the person who was running it counselled against meditation as a tool for actors because he mm. said that meditation is all about the breath in. It's all about the... <gasps> whereas acting is all about the breath out. Ah, it's all about the giving rather than the, the taking in. Oh, see, I wouldn't agree with that at all. Ah. <laughs> I, I think it depends on what sort of meditation. Maybe I certainly don't do any breathing in meditation. Well, there you go. <laughs> um, I, shall, meditation... I shall trash that piece of wisdom that's been with me for 30 years. <laughs> no, the meditation I do is a silent um, meditation. There are many, many, many forms of meditation, millions and millions. Um, and I would say that what meditation has given me is generosity. It has given me a, an enormous sense of a feeling of oneness with other people and therefore even when I come out of it you know at my eyes from meditation the overwhelming feeling is one of wanting to give and I would meditate before doing a performance on stage because it connects me with people mm -hmm. it makes me feel like I am one I am indivisible from other people that it is not about me, it's not about my ego, it's not about what I've got to offer personally, it's what can I go and give. Forget about the work I've done, forget about me, just go out and give and connect with those people. So that's what it definitely gives me. And I think it's very much a breath out when you <laughs> when you come out of meditation. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. <sighs> Ah, so there you are. I've debunked that one. Ah, uh, yes. No, thank you. <laughs> but look, I, I, that, that argument, that, that quote, was probably the way I was feeling. Yeah. That, you know, it can make you feel very calm and very mm. one note. And that's why I did stop meditating. I felt too calm. I felt too complacent. I thought I wasn't interesting enough. I thought I was only touching the surface of things. So I think with anything, balance is everything. You know, you don't want to become a sage if you want to be, be able to 
experience the ups and downs of life. Right. So you need a bit of both. You have to choose between sage and stage. Uh. <laughs> boom, boom. Um, your book is rich in character studies, Heather. Uh, it's one of the joys of reading this book. In fact, you talk about people the way actors talk about their characters. I, I can see how they move, how they talk. It's fantastic. You've got such a great eye. You talk about your auntie Rosemary, yeah. who was very regal, and it's, it's, it's a complex portrait of her, but I'd love you to tell us about the time <laughs> she visited you backstage at the Sydney Opera House. Oh, uh, look, we've been doing a, we did a production of um, The Cherry Orchard and uh, she came to see it and at, back then you were allowed to, to have people up to the green room and she'd come up, we was, uh, the cast and I, which included Hugo Weaving and Jane Harders and Deborah Kennedy, it was a fantastic cast. We were sitting near the big glass windows in the green room. She came up the lift and she was wearing this fur coat with a little... I even think she had on a little tiara thing in her hair, uh, but she had gloves on and she always carried a little Instamatic camera dangling by her wrist. And she came into the green room and she saw the myriad of ballet dancers in their tutus warming up and stretching and having their lunch. And she saw the opera singers and she saw all the, and the crew members. And I just saw her face and she lit up. And she went from one group to the other asking and shaking their hands and telling them how beautiful they were and what joy they gave the world. And then she asked if she could take photos of them. And I even saw a, a, a beautiful woman to do curtsy to her. And she gradually made her way down to where we were sitting and um, smiled to each of the cast members and told them how wonderful they were. And, and then turned to me and, and sat next to me and patted my knee with her gloved hand and said, never mind, darling. Everyone else was very good. <laughs> and it was so perfect because I knew that she didn't mean I wasn't good, but I knew instantly, knowing her so well, that she had just hoped I hadn't played. It was such a shame I played a dowdy role because the other women were glamorous in it and I was playing the housekeeper. And she just wanted to see me a little more glamorous. Yeah, something prettier. Not the loveless Varia. Not the loveless Varia carrying the <laughs> clunky keys, that's all. <laughs> Can we talk briefly about how you see your relationship between yourself and, and the characters you play? Because you say you're not a method actor. You're very clear about this. Yes, when I say I'm not a method actor, I think in the classic uh, definition of a method actor, I do not um, work myself up into a state using my own emotional life. And then I do not carry it on beyond the realms of the work I'm doing. So I work quite methodically mm -hmm. um, when I'm approaching a role, whether it's film, television or theatre. I do a lot of research. I look for facts. I then use my imagination. I don't immediately jump in and learn lines. For me, in terms of emotionally with a character, the whole thing is an investigation. I try not to make assumptions about what a character's emotional state is because any assumption I make will be mine. So initially I use my own instinctive responses, but then I love nothing more than a director to challenge those. And if I don't have a director who will do that, then I, I have to challenge them and say, well, look, that's my instinctive response, but what would this person's response be? And so when you're working with great actors, for instance, when I was just working with Hugo in Love Me, a TV series which um, we've just done the second season of, it was so, the beautiful thing about working with Hugo was rehearsing with him. So he and I would just talk and talk and talk and we'd work out what each scene was about, what was happening in the scene, um, you know, where the discussions were coming from. And that's the exciting part mm. for me yeah, yeah. of the process is the unearthing of things and the investigation. Mm. You're so candid in this book about the challenges of your life, Heather. But through all of it, you do radiate this powerful sense of a belief in something and i'd love to come back to, to that point where we started because you've shown just how rational and analytic you are but there is something more can you get close to what that something is look i think i don't know i think that there's genetically i think things that are passed on through families that there are certain things that are always the genetics which are physical things and us down to ourselves but I think there are also genetic, we, we carry on histories from the past. So I feel like deep inside me, uh, whether it's the Quaker gene or something, which is to do with silent meditation and spirituality, there is something 
beyond explanation that is just fair to do with believing that everything will be okay in the world somehow. I look to the positive more than the negative. I also, within me, I am a practical person, so I will do all the, Martin, my husband pointed out to me recently, he said to me, you're someone who just goes, I'll do all the research, I'll do everything else, tick every box, and then I'll wait for a sign. He said, it's like you do all the work and then you throw it away and wait for a sign. And I thought that was the best yeah. um, actual description of who I am, is that I will, I'll do all the work maybe even just to satisfy myself that I've done it. But then I do always just let it all go and go sailing off and hope that there'll be a sign. And each time there is. We've got to stop here, though. It's been an absolute joy. Congratulations on the book. Thank you so much. It's a beautiful thing. And uh, took us for whatever's coming next. What is coming next? Um, look, I'm very excitedly going to the Writers' Festivals, which I'm really excited about. And then I don't know. I'll wait for a sign. You wait for a sign. <laughs> <laughs> Heather, Heather Mitchell signing off. She's a featured writer at the Melbourne Writers Festival uh, this year. You can hear in conversation with Fran Kelly on Sunday the 7th of May at 3 o'clock. There are tickets available through the festival website. That festival, the Melbourne Writers Festival, runs from the 4th to the 7th of May. And Heather's memoir, which we've been discussing, is called Everything and Nothing. It's published by Alan and Unwin, and it's marvellous. And uh, you can see Heather in season two of Love Me, which is now screening on Binge. I'm Michael Cathcart, and this is The Stage Show. Yeah. There you go. <clears throat> the Stage Show. <clears throat> I'm going to post that under the title Dead Baby Dreaming. Because that was the bit that kind of grabbed me by the frontal lobes the first time I heard it. And I thought to myself, well... If I manage, it wouldn't be bad to record that and share it with the viewers and the subscribers. Anybody who's got any ideas as to how it is or why it is that a two-year-old who was trying to sleep in what used to be the operating theatre of an abortion clinic was waking up at two o'clock in the morning and screaming dead babies when they only had a five word vocabulary. And this went on for weeks. Mum and the family had no idea why until somebody come to visit and freaked out. You live here, you know, like, gee, well, this used to be a, a, a termination clinic. And, you know, like, yeah, that, that, that room over there was the operating theater and that was the recovery and yeah, and then when the kid's in his teens and he hears his first ghost story around a campfire, he nearly shits himself. And she still didn't tell him. She didn't traumatise him with what she knew. I'm really impressed with that. Um, but anybody who's got any significant hypotheses as to why it is that the two-year-old baby couldn't sleep in the abortion clinic because of the dead babies that kept waking him up and making him scream about them, I'd be very interested here in the comment section why you think that was happening. And if any of you happen to be pro-abortionists or atheists, I'd be even more fascinated to hear your take on that matter. Because um, what can I say? I find it an absolutely riveting story. And by the sound of it, the lady is well respected with a good long lifetime reputation for not being a bullshit artist. Otherwise, you know, why would she be a music? Why would she be being interviewed by Michael Cathcart on the stage show on ABC Radio? Warbles on a lot to YouTube. You never know what you're gonna stumble across on the radio. Ciao.